Hello everyone and welcome to Boundless Dentistry. In this video, we'll talk about an important syndrome that we do encounter in our clinical practices and often we have to treat such patients because they do present to us with various dental anomalies. So this syndrome is called as pear robin syndrome. It is also called as pear robin sequence as well. So in this video, we talk about everything that you need to know about pear robin syndrome. So let's get started. Now, in this diagrammatic picture, you can appreciate that this is a picture of an infant and you can appreciate three features which are not normal. Firstly, you can see that there is an opening present which is between the nasal cavity and the oral cavity. Normally, there is palate present between them separating the nasal and the oral cavity. However, in these patients, there is a direct opening between the nasal and the oral cavity that is called as cleft palate. Next, you can see that this is the tongue and this tongue appears to be quite large as compared to the normal tongue and it is placed a little bit backwards directly over the trachea. So this leads to breathing difficulties. That is the second characteristic feature of pear robin syndrome. Other than that, you can also appreciate that this dotted line is denoting the normal position of the mandible where the mandible should be present. However, in pear robin patient, the mandible is placed backwards also called as retrognathia or macronathia thereby further hampering the respiratory distress for such patients so these three characteristic feature defines pear robin sequence anomaly or you can even call it as a syndrome now this is a congenital anomaly which targets mainly the face but there are other systematic features which can also be encountered in such patients now there are three main features which we have just talked about. Firstly, cleft palate, then retrognathia, which is the backward positioning of the mandible, and lastly, glossoptosis, which basically means that the enlarged tongue is placed backwards, thereby compromising the respiratory function of such patients. Now, talking about the etiology and pathogenesis of pear robin syndrome, firstly, the one thing that you should know that this is an idiopathic condition. There is no direct causative agent for pear robin syndrome. However, there it is known that it is an autosomal recessive disorder and some studies have concluded that there is some dysregulation of SOX9 gene which basically interferes in the facial structures formation thereby giving us some hint that this gene might possibly be responsible for causing pear robin syndrome now it is known that during the 7th to 10th gestational period there is some interference in the mandibular formation leading to mandibular hypoplasia thereby being responsible for one of the characteristic feature of pear robin syndrome now in these patients we see that the tongue is placed a little bit high during the gestational period so for the palate to form the palatine shelves have to meet and close in the midline since the tongue is placed a little bit up so it does not allow the palatine shells to close thereby it remains open and leading to cleft palate so this is the etiology and pathogenesis that you should remember about and is very important for you to understand pear robin syndrome now Let's talk about the clinical features which you should know and these are very important because pear robin syndrome is basically diagnosed on the basis of clinical examination. So, so far we've talked about the main three characteristic features of patient who suffer from pear robin syndrome. Firstly, we have saw that patient suffer from glossoptosis that is the tongue is placed posteriorly and it's enlarged thereby leading to breathing difficulties. We have also appreciated that these patients have micronathia or retrognathia where the mandible is placed severely backwards thereby also compromising breathing function of such patients and we have appreciated that patients suffer from cleft palate. So these are the three main features which most of the times are encountered in a patient who is suffering from pear robin syndrome. Other than that sometimes and other rare features which may encounter in patients include repeated air infections, presence of natal teeth, which is teeth which are present at birth and most likely they are mandibular central incisors. 
other than that sometimes abnormality in the pharynx is noted short stretcher of the patient sometimes mid facial hypoplasia is also appreciated and sometimes although rarely limited joint movements are also present so for such patients these three features glossoptosis retronathia and cleft lip and palate these are the main characteristic feature which actually defines this condition so you should keep these three features in mind and other features may or may not be encountered in such patients so the clinical features are of utmost importance because it actually helps us to diagnose such patients now talking about differential diagnosis firstly we can differentiate it from chart syndrome childhood sleep apnea die jorg syndrome fetal alcohol syndrome and lastly mandibulofacial dysostosis also called as trisha collins syndrome so the differential diagnosis is in almost all pathologies always helpful because it actually helps us so that we do not miss out on any pathology and actually helps us to reach our definitive diagnosis now talking about how to actually diagnose this condition mainly this condition is diagnosed at birth by the presence of three classical features which we have just talked about which is smaller jaw glossoptosis and cleft palate these patient experience breathing difficulties and they also experience feeding difficulties so mainly on the basis of clinical examination such condition is diagnosed now let's talk about how do we actually manage such patient because since they are infant and it is challenging and difficult to treat such patients but we have a goal that we should keep in mind while we are treating such patients that is establish and facilitate breathing because that is of utmost importance in such patients next important thing is feeding because when they will feed then they will actually grow and flourish and basically it will help in growth so firstly we go for conservative management which is treating respiratory symptoms first now to treat respiratory symptoms we can place the patient in a lateral position which actually makes the tongue a little bit in a forward position which can help the patient in breathing other than that oral airway placement is also a useful option wear a laryngeal mask and you can intubate the patient which helps them in breathing other than that in some cases where there is macronethia is a little bit severe you can also go for intubation which helps the patient in breathing the next thing that we manage is feeding symptoms basically what we can do is feeding the patient in an upright technique helps a lot in such patients other than that temporarily we can place nasogastric and orogastric tubes which initially in the first few you can say days it actually helps in feeding and placement of gastrostomy can also be done in when technique 1 and 2 does not help the patient so respiratory and feeding symptoms should be managed first and we initially start with conservative management if these things are not resolved by these techniques then we go for surgical management so when we talk about surgical management basically surgical management takes place when we know that the severity of disease is quite much that respiratory distress and feeding difficulties are still present so how do we treat that firstly we go for tracheostomy because tracheostomy can be life saving in such patients because it actually helps the patient to breathe when the airway obstruction is so severe that conservative management of was of no use other than that we can go for glossopexy which basically ties the tongue in a forward position surgically so that it enables the patient to breathe properly but this should be performed before speech development has occurred in such patient so this is one condition which you should keep in mind to treat macronethia we can go for mandibular lengthening surgeries which is called as distraction surgery or you can call as distraction osteogenesis is basically used to treat patient who suffer from severe mandibular hypoplasia because it basically puts two cuts in the mandible and places the mandible in a forward position so that it will eventually help growth and respiratory symptoms management for such patients now these are two diagrams first diagram is showing distraction osteogenesis where you can appreciate that two cuts are made in the mandible and then the mandible is placed slightly forward which is called as distraction osteogenesis surgery and it is only performed in severe cases or you can say in older adults in cases of for example 
respiratory distress on aesthetic purposes because this surgery is quite complex and it's painful for the patient and takes a lot of time to recover. In this picture, you can see that this is called as glossopexy. This basically means that the tongue is tied forward so that space is available for trachea and the patient can breathe, not completely properly, but it is life-saving for such patients. Now, lastly talking about prognosis, prognosis generally for such patients is good despite they do suffer from airway and feeding difficulties. So proper management is of utmost importance for such patients so that they can grow properly into adulthood. So it is of utmost importance to do proper management of such patients starting from infant up to adulthood. So in this video, we talked about everything that you need to know about pear robin syndrome, starting off with what actually is this syndrome, what are the main three characteristic features that you should always know to diagnose the patient. Then we talk about etiology, pathogenesis, then we talked about the different clinical features, how do we actually diagnose it and how do we actually differentiate it from other syndromes. And then we talked about how do we actually manage such patients and then we finally talked about what is the prognosis of such patients. So I hope this video was useful for you and if you like this video, please like, share, subscribe and press the bell icon. Thank you for watching this video. See you next time.